Well, the Bible reading for today is Psalm 131, Psalm 131. And you can find that on the screen or follow along in your pew Bibles at home. I'm going to read from the Christian Standard Bible, Psalm 131. A Davidic song of ascents, Lord, my heart is not proud, my eyes are not haughty. I do not get involved with things too great or too difficult for me. Instead, I've calmed and quieted myself like a little weaned child with its mother. I'm like a little child. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to spend a bit of time working our way through this psalm. Uh, You'll find an outline there on the screen. You might have printed it off. Uh, If you have any questions, please feel free to email them through to Neil or myself. At uh, times like this, uh, as we close out a year, unlike anything many of us have ever experienced, uh, it's often worth pausing and asking, what has sustained me? What's given me both momentum and rest? Where has my hope been established this year? Now, over the last few days, as the year has come to a close, are the numerous articles that have emerged in newspapers and news feeds, looking back over the year, have nominated all sorts of answers to these questions, humanity, science, cooperation, our national psyche, habits and routines, hobbies, familiar things, learning new stuff, family, relationships, community. And the recent spike in COVID in Sydney has exposed some of these and their fragility. As someone wise close to me said, if your hope was in the holiday season to be, well, well, where is our hope? Where is our rest? What sustains us? Let me pray, and then we're going to dive into God's Word. Father, thank you for your Word. Thank you for Psalm 131, three short verses. But there is a lot here that sustains us. Please apply to our hearts and minds so that as we face 2021, we'll be sustained by the same truth that has always existed, your Son on the throne for us. Amen. Well, titles are so important, aren't they? I'm at point one on the outline. It's one of the things I love about a decent crime novel. The title is often as much fun to understand as the mystery, sometimes equally enlightening. That's no different with a psalm. Now, a psalm is a poem, often a song. Uh, The poetry of God's people was compiled as a book sometime after they came back to the land that God had given them, when they'd been away in exile for their rebellion against God. Uh, The Psalms themselves seem to have been written across a vast amount of time, uh, from the time of Moses right into the period where God's people were away from the land under God's judgment. Compiled after God's people returned to the land, uh, the book of Psalms was meant to be used by God's people as they gathered together as a mob. Uh, To put it simply, it's the hymn book of the people of God. Organised into five books, The Psalms range across the vast plane of human experience and emotion. At their heart, they're a response to the world lived in by dwelling with God, refuge with him, dependent upon God's revelation of himself in his word. Now, towards the end of the book are a set of Psalms titled Songs of Ascent, Psalms 120 to 134. The title's debated, it's discussed, But at least this much seems to be clear. They were sung by God's people as they walked up to the temple in Jerusalem, gathering as a community in the presence of God. The temple was that huge building that sat in Jerusalem at the top of the hill that symbolised God dwelling with his mob. It's also the place of sacrifice, a symbol that something significant stood between God and his people and them living together, stopping their dwelling together. And so the walk to the temple in Jerusalem was up a hill, an ascent. The image is one we need to capture in our minds, the image of God's people streaming in for one of the key festivals in the life of God's people. As they come streaming in from their homes and their villages stretched out on the roads, these are the songs they would have sung, lifting their eyes to the top of that hill, to that great symbol of God's desire to live with his people, And the sin, the attitude and action in each of their hearts that said, I'm God and God's not, that kept them apart. 
and the symbol of sacrifice that displayed both the cost of sin and the cost of God's forgiveness, all of that is represented in that symbol they see as they lift their eyes as they walk up the hill and they would have sung as they gazed at that temple. Well, that's not all in the title, is it? There's a bit more too, isn't there, than just a song of ascent. Uh, the Psalms ascribe to David, it's Davidic. Remember David? Described by God as a man after his own heart, chosen by God to lead his people, taken from the humble place of the youngest son, shepherd in the paddock, showered by God's promise to send the king of the universe from his own family line for God to build him a house through someone who would be God's own son. Well, David had been the greatest of the kings of God's people. Brave and poetic, emotional, mercurial, violent, gentle. He was a, he was a man who'd known the heights of kingly authority and success, the depths of sin's consequence in his own life. That's some title, isn't it? A song composed by the greatest of God's kings of his people to be sung as God's people gathered together in Jerusalem at the symbol of God's desire to dwell with his mob. Some title. Well, the poem itself is quite simple, perhaps even maybe even more simple than the title. The poem itself is quite simple, three short verses with imagery that resonates deeply with our own experiences in life. And that point two on the outline. Now, the first verse gives an honest assessment of the psalmist, of those seeing the psalm. Lord, my heart is not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I do not get involved with things too great or too difficult for me. Now, we need to keep the image that we've just been given by the title of the psalm in our minds. God's people sing this song as they climb the hill into Jerusalem to gather as God's mob. And as they climb that hill, remember, they lift their gaze and there stands that massive symbol of God's desire to dwell with his people. There stands a place of sacrifice symbolising that there's something between God and his people. There stands the reminder of who God's people are and such a reminder creates a statement of humility in the psalmist. Now I know who I am, confronted by God, God's desire, my problem. Now I know who I am. It's expressed in a series of three knots. I'm not proud, I'm not haughty or arrogant, not involved with things too great or too difficult for me. It's a statement of limits really, isn't it? A recognition of the limits that we humans have faced by the magnificence of the symbol of God's place with his mob. The psalmist states very clearly, I'm limited. And that's what true humility is, isn't it? A realistic assessment of who I am before God. A realistic assessment of who I am before God. Uh, but the statement goes further than just, I'm so tiny. You see, that last not there at the end of verse 1 literally means I've not occupied myself with great matters, with things too wondrous for me. Now, those words translated great matters and wondrous things are applied to the works of God alone in Psalms. Psalm 86 verse 10, Psalm 136 verse 4, Psalm 145 verses 5 to 6. I, I suspect the psalmist recognises not just his limits, but also his tendency to think he has no limits. I think the psalmist here is confessing his sin, that he has the tendency and desire to seek to do the things of God when they're the province of God alone. In that sense, he's confessing, confronted by the symbol of God dwelling with his mob, that he's stretched too far, seeking to be God instead of God which leads to a statement of repentance. Look at verse 2. Instead, I've calmed and quieted myself like a little weaned child with its mother. I'm like a little child. Instead, it's a statement of contrast, isn't it? Well, what follows is the result of what he's just recognised, his humility, this statement of confession. Instead of attempting to be God, what does he decide instead? Well, repentance is to turn from attempting to be God instead of God to turn to God being God. Let me say that again. Repentance is to turn from attempting to be God instead of God and to turn to God being God. 
instead here displays that to me. Oh, what does it look like? Uh, images are so powerful, aren't they, when they touch on our everyday lives. A Paul Kelly song, How to Make Gravy, is heartbreaking in the way it makes, makes the, the making of gravy a, an image of the pain of Christmas separation. Now, the image that the psalmist chooses here to describe the life of repentance is a, a familiar image, one like making gravy. It's the image of a satisfied and quieted child crawling into its parents' arms, snuggling in, dependent, filled, secure. Yeah, you've seen it. You've experienced it. I loved it when my kids would crawl into my arms. They're a bit big now. But when they'd crawl into your arms and just lie there, secure, satisfied, dependent, filled. That's what the psalmist commits to. Instead of aspiring to, grasping at what only God can do and be, he says, I'm crawling into his arms, resting in them. Well, confronted by his own limit, the psalmist has confessed his aspirations beyond what he's made for, humbled, repentant. He now turns to dependence upon God alone and looks around at those with him walking up the hill and says, hey, men and women, hope in God alone. Do the same. Look at verse 3. Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forever. I'm at point four on the outline. Faced by the temple, all that is bared in his soul, all that's been confronted in his soul, the psalmist calls those with him, the people of God, to depend upon the Lord alone. Now, his choice of God's name has purpose. It's revealing. The Lord is the covenantal name of God. It's meant to cast the minds of the readers, the walkers, the listeners, the singers back to the history of God across all of time. It's the name used of God in Genesis 2 when he makes people in his image. It's the name used of God in Genesis 3 when God comes into the garden as human sinned and rejected him, as God confronted their sin in his mercy and justice, as God committed to crushing the snake. It's the name used of God in Genesis 12 when he talks to an idol worshipper called Abraham and says, through your, Abra through your family, Abraham, I'll roll back sin and bring blessing. It's the name used by God as he meets his people in Exodus 19 so that they can be his people and represent him to the world. It's the name used of God as he takes David in 2 Samuel. Samuel 7 and says, David, you're not going to build me a house. I'm going to build you a house instead and through your house my one and only son will come into the world and rule it rightly. And when the Lord is used, God's people are meant to go, I, I know that God. He's got a track record. He's got a track record of complete and utter consistency of commitment and dependability. It's into the arms of that Lord that we need to crawl as a dependent child. That's what the psalmist is saying. And the temple has reminded him as he walks up to it of this Lord's constant commitment. His personal response leads to a corporate call. God's people should hope in the Lord alone because the Lord alone can be depended upon. Just look at his works. But... It's such a marvellously simple statement of truth, isn't it? A statement of humility, confession, repentance, a statement of dependence and a call to God's mob. But how can I sing this song? On a number of levels, I struggle to know how this song can be mine. On a purely superficial level, I'm not with the psalmist as he walks up that hill to Jerusalem. I'm separated by culture, climate, geography, time. On a slightly deeper level, I know that even the author who wrote this psalm struggled with seeing this very psalm in his life. Just look at David's life. At significant moments, this man aspired to great works, to be God instead of God, and it destroyed so much. If even the psalmist struggled to sing this psalm in their lives, what hope do I have? And on the deepest level, I know that my heart is constantly seeking to be God instead of God. My natural instinct, it's so tiring but so irresistible. I want to bother myself with great works and wondrous deeds so people know how great I am, how I can do better as God than God. 
And this year of all years, it's such a reality every year, but this year of all years, the agitation that comes from <coughs> such plight, such misplaced hope has been stark and clear. We can't even beat a virus, yet we aspire to great deeds and wondrous works. We never more clearly revealed as futile when we seek to be God. It's a perennial problem we face as humans. It's the problem stated by the mere presence of the temple at the top of that hill. We want to be God. It fails consistently. God wants to dwell with us so we can be whole. And these clash and we're separated from him. So how can I sing it? How might this problem be dealt with? Well, the reason anyone can sing this psalm is because God kept his promise to Abraham and David, Matthew 1.1, the historical record of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus, the blokes whose birth we celebrated only two days ago, Jesus is the one promised by God to roll back sin and bring blessing and to rule the world as God's promised king. He's the end point of everything that God speaks throughout the Old Testament. Let me, let me be even blunter. Jesus is Psalm 131. In humility, Jesus knew his place in the world, his place before God. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Independence, we're told that Jesus constantly threw himself into his Father's arms. In Matthew 14, verse 23, he is seen going away to pray as he's tempted to take matters into his own hands. In Matthew 26, verse, uh, Matthew 23, verse 39, Jesus commits himself into his father's hands and says, not my plan, but yours, father. In Luke 23, 46, Jesus says on the cross, into your hands I commit my spirit, father. In trusting God, Jesus committed his way to the Lord. Think of his baptism and then his temptation in the wilderness in Luke chapter 3 and 4. On every level, Jesus was what God's people should have been. More deeply, Jesus is what we humans should be. He understood that before God he was dependent upon his Father and so he lived by trusting in the Lord. His hope was in the Lord alone, even as he hung on the cross. And that hope took him from heaven to earth, from the cradle to the life we should have lived, to the cross where he died for sinners, to the resurrection where he was crowned with everything that God promised, showing that he'd done everything that the temple symbolised. God could dwell with his people because Jesus had been his people for his people. He'd borne their sin by depending upon the Father as they should have. That's why anyone can sing this psalm, because Jesus is the psalm. And so in Matthew 19, verse 13, Jesus issues this invitation. I'm at point seven on the outline. Then children were brought to him so that he might put his hands on them and pray, but the disciples rebuked them. Then Jesus said, leave the children alone. Don't try to keep them from coming to me because the kingdom of heaven is made up of people like this. And after putting his hands on them, he went on from there. In essence, Jesus is uttering an invitation for people to come to him because he is the one who is Psalm 131. To come to Jesus is to recognise our sin to recognise our need to depend, to hope in him alone like a child in the arms of their parents, quieted and satisfied. How can I sing this psalm, Psalm 131? By dealing with Jesus, by depending upon him because he is that psalm. And that in turn takes us back to our opening question, doesn't it? Uh, what do we depend on? What do we hope in? What sustains us? Well, the psalm lays out two very clear options if you look at it again. On the, on the one hand, we have the option of pride and agitation, of seeking the great works and wondrous deeds that God alone can do. Or we can exercise the pride that walks before God and says, God, I can do it better than you. And this will bring with it all the agitation, stress and failure that comes from trying to be God when we're not. On the other hand, we can be humbled. 
we can confess, we can repent, we can throw ourselves upon Jesus, who is the one who lived this psalm for us so that he could die for us and rise to hold us. Only that second option will navigate all that life in this broken world delivers and lays at our feet. Only this second option will deal with who we truly are and what this world is truly like. Only this second option will lead to rest in a restless world. What does it actually look like? Well, I think it's as simple as three things. Timing God's word, reading it, grappling with it, understanding it, thinking through it like the way we've just thought through Psalm 131. I think it involves time praying God's word. What a great prayer to pray this week. Every day, Psalm 131, God, this is who I am. I throw myself upon you. Let my hope be in you alone. And I think it also means time with God's mob. And it's very important to notice that a psalm like this moves from an individual singing the song with an exhortation to the mob, existing as part of the mob, is part of God's design as he gathers his people in through Jesus Christ. The consequence of those three simple things, time in God's word, time praying God's word, time with God's mob, the consequence will be a constant humbling, a constant refreshing, a constant resting, a constant trusting in the constant Lord. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you for Psalm 131, such a simple psalm. But, Father, wow, it's pretty profound, really. Uh, Father, that image of walking up to the temple and then what that means and the problem and then how Jesus deals with it for us and then how it's applied to us. Uh, Father, help us to really rest in you to actually depend upon you, to crawl into your arms because Jesus is Psalm 131. Father, uh, please allow this psalm and the truth that it brings us to to drive us through 2021. Amen.